just to kind of uh, help take up some time. But uh, I do want to go ahead and pray and, and not kind of get, you know, beside myself. And the Word of God gets me stirred up, and, and I believe that it's one thing that's lacking. Um, I, I told somebody, you know, in traveling around as an evangelist, I've been places, they would hand me a piece of paper or maybe even several sheets and say, these are things you can't preach here. And there are some folks don't want that because they feel like you're meddling. But if it's done in the right spirit and it comes from God, it, it'll be right. It'll be in decency and order. And, and, you know, and then there are those that, you know, handle things in the wrong manner. And, you know, and they try to throw it at you instead of to you. And, uh, and I, I, I remember hearing a story one time of a man who said he heard the same message twice in one week. And he didn't get saved the first time. But he got saved the second, and they asked him, said, why didn't you accept the Lord? It was exactly the same thought, same scripture, same basic idea. He said, well, this man told me I was going to hell, but he seemed like he was glad about that. <laughs> and he said, but this man told me I was going to hell, but I felt his compassion and that he didn't want me to go there and make the mistakes that other people had made. And he said, that's what touched my heart. And I think sometimes it's about the delivery. And in Isaiah, Isaiah made a statement uh, that is so very, very important. He said, the Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that's weary. And anybody that's married ought to be able to say amen right there because sometimes in the marriage, it ain't what you say, it's what they think you said. Amen. Hello. And, and, and you know it's it's how it's how you say it that that or how they interpret. So sometimes it's not that we're not telling them the truth; it's how we're bringing it out. Right. So you can tell the truth, but if you say it a lot of times in the wrong tone and whatever, it's not accepted. It's not and, and it's toned out and it's missed because of the way it's perceived. I know I'm guilty of that. I think we all are guilty of that at some point. But uh, let's let's have a word of prayer, if everybody would, for just Can a minute. I ask for something? Yes. Uh, I went to the dentist yesterday, and a friend of mine, she said, "Well, what's happened down at your church?" I said, "Well, our pastor resigned, and um, she started. I thought she was just going to break down and start crying, and she said, "Have you heard about our church?" And I said, "No, I've not heard anything." And she said uh, that they had have a real bad problem in their church too, and. She was broken hearted, and so when when I left there, I said, I'm going to pray for your church, and you pray for my church. Right, but right. I want you to remember her church. We'll do that. We'll do that. And <laughs> uh, you don't have to touch hands, and you don't have to reach out, but you know what? It'd be good to just put your hands out and pray for each other. Heavenly Father, most righteous God, Lord, as we come tonight once again in the name of Jesus, God, I thank you. God, I praise you for the power of prayer. God, that prayer changes things. You said the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. It availeth much. And God, I thank you tonight that, Lord, that we can call upon that name that is bigger than any problem that we'll ever face more bigger than cancer, bigger than confusion and drama. God, I pray that, Lord, that you would reach down, amen, tonight, God, and begin to touch. God, every need, God, every situation that's out there. And God, I pray, Lord, would you reach down tonight, God, and I move in this little service. God, give us a good service tonight. God, give us the direction and the liberty, God, that you would have for us. And God, I thank you, Lord. I praise you, God, for who you are. God, you're a great God and greatly to be praised. God bless tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. Well, praise the Lord. I'm so glad for that tonight that we can pray, and prayer makes a difference. As you've heard me say before, and you'll hear me say again probably, one of the statements that I really don't like that we make sometimes is, all I can do is pray, because it makes it sound like you've tried everything else, and as your last resort, you're finally praying about it. And if we would only realize the privilege and the honor that it is to be able to go before God and pray. The Bible said in Hebrews 4.16, Let us therefore come boldly before the throne room of grace that we might obtain mercy 
and find grace to help in our time of need. But it's kind of like over in the book of Esther that, you know, when the enemy was plotting and raging and Mordecai came and said, you need to go in and plead to the king. She said, I haven't been invited, you know. But uh, when she went in, the king delighted in her. And our God delights in us and he wants us to come. But sometimes we let fear cause us to stand back. And I see it a lot of times in service. Folks needing to come get on the altar. Folks needing prayer. Folks needing, you know, hands laid on them, needing encouragement. And because of the lies of the enemy and that unworthy feeling, they sit back and they let the enemy steal, kill, and destroy. And uh, so we need to overcome that. And prayer really is about cashing in on the promises of God. And uh, prayer is a very powerful thing. You know, the early church, if they had to give up on Peter, Peter would have died in Acts 12. But prayer went out from the church without ceasing for Peter in Acts 12, and God sent an angel and brought him right out of that. And I believe that the church, you know, if we would pray, just like they did in Acts 4, you know, grant unto us that with all boldness that, you know, that we can preach the word of God and that signs and wonders may be done in the name of thy holy child Jesus Christ, you know, that if we would pray and, and believe God for the miracles, I believe God wants to do miracles. I believe the Holy Ghost wants to confirm the word, you know, in our life. I believe God hasn't changed in the same dawn that did it in yesteryear, can do it today. It's just we're not paying the price. Amen. Don't shout me down. Amen. But it's true. And so, uh, you know, uh, I, I think that prayer is just so very important. And sometimes we even get kind of buffaloed out of prayer because, you know, there are times that it's easy. And, I mean, you know, it's like preaching almost. I mean, you feel the Lord just moving. And then there are those times you trip over your tongue. You ever do that? Yeah. Can't get out of your head to come out your mouth the way that you'd like. And the devil just says, just give up. But that's when you need to kind of shake yourself Clear your head for a moment and then try again. Don't give up. Don't let the devil cheat you out of the beauty of prayer. All right. Anybody got anything to say before we get into our scripture? And I mentioned this once before. All right, John chapter 19. Amen. John chapter 19. Just a couple of little nuggets before we get into Revelation chapter 1. And I actually threw this together in some of the notes so you'll be able to see it. I want to look at about... Uh, Three things tonight, and that's included in Revelation chapter 1. And uh, beginning in uh, John 19, verse 17, And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place that is called the place uh, of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him on either side, one and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title, when read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified, was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and in Greek and in Latin. Then said the chief priest of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am King of the Jews. And Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Now, the reason why I got to looking at this many, many years ago, and, uh, and I know that you're not going to be able to really see the sign, is I had seen a crucifixion sign with the term I-N-R-I above it, and I wondered, why is it like that? You know, it, it caused me to start searching it out in the Scripture to try to find out why does it have that above it. I thought, well, is it just you know, one of these languages that are mentioned. But I found something very interesting when I began to look at this. And uh, this is really an what's called an acronym. It's like my name is Kevin Blake Mullins, and what they did is drop the K, the B, the M. In other words, they take the first letter of the word down and made the abbreviation, and that's why you have the I-N-R-I above it. And I have a picture here on this other page of what that would have looked like, written in Hebrew, written in Greek, and then in the Latin. And I thought, why did the Jews get so upset and say, write not that he is, but write that he said? Well, when I began to look at it using the same principle, 
uh, in the Hebrew, the Hebrew is different than English. English, we write left to right, but in Hebrew, it's read right to left. So if you drop down the first character of each one of those uh, words, it looks like this right here. And again, you're not going to be able to see this as good until you get the notes. But uh, you'd be surprised what that said. That's why those Orthodox Jews got so upset because you know what that spells? It spells Yahweh, the name of God. That's a little nugget that's right there. I mean, they said right not that he is, but right that he said because it would have no longer said Yahweh. And Pilate said, what I have written, I have written. And so I want to encourage you to get in and study the Bible because there is no coincidence in the Scripture. Mm. And sometimes I think we really cheat ourselves whenever we kind of skip over things and think, well, I don't understand that. Maybe we need to chew on it a little bit. We need to, you know, meditate upon it. And the Bible does say in Psalms 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law did he meditate both day and night. And I think sometimes we get so wrapped up in reading the Scripture that we think it's about quantity instead of quality. And you can read 50 chapters in a day, but if you don't retain it, what good has it really done you? And uh, I've met people that maybe knew some of the most simplest truths of the Scripture, but they had a very powerful prayer life. And that's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, let no man rob you of the simplicity that's in Christ. So it's something I just wanted to take and throw out there, and I wanted you to be able to see it for yourself. And don't take my word for it, but look it up, and you'll see in the pictures that uh, those characters are down, and you can Google it. it you know, uh, used to be uh, folks had to uh, have a Strong's and had to have all kind of reference books, but now because of the Internet, you know, you can see these things. And so even the most minute detail is there, not only to take up space, but it's there for a reason. That's why the Bible said the things that were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scripture might have hope. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, he talks about the things that were written before uh, were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world have come. And uh, so I tell people, instead of turning to the news, the what is it, 6 o'clock news? We ought to look to the Word of God because the Word of God is the Word that has the answers for us. There's so much fake news out there, but the Word of God is forever settled in heaven. And he said, let God be the truth and every man a liar. Amen? Amen. And so I think that this will really, you know, maybe encourage you to look at some of the things that are in there. And there are so many things in the Scripture over the years that I have stumbled on that I thought, wow, that's neat. And to think that God would put that in there for us. And uh, even punctuation and spellings, the way things are spelled are there. Not because of coincidence. You know, the very God of heaven, he didn't just throw this out there aimlessly. But he said that the word of God is so important that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And he said he was against. He told Jeremiah, he said, I'm against that man that steals my word from his neighbor. So we must really understand how important the word of God is to us today. And Paul even said over to Timothy, he didn't say, make sure you shout real good. He said, preach the word. Because when you preach the word and you're instant in season and out of season, then everything else will come out of that. Matthew 6 and 33 said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added. So it's like God has given us the ingredients, and if we will get in and study the recipe, the cake will always come out right. Any comments? Se second thing I want to show you, it's just a very minute little detail I want to show you. Turn over to Ezekiel 28. Then we're going to... When we cover this, we'll get into uh, Revelation chapter 1 for tonight. But Ezekiel chapter 28. And I want to talk to you for just a few minutes from a couple of scriptures here. And uh, this is something I, I preached years ago. 
and more and more folks are, are noticing this now than, than ever before. And I'm glad that God has given people a desire to get deeper into the Word because that's where the answers are. I really believe that. I believe the Word of God is, is the key to this thing. But uh, Ezekiel chapter 28, um, beginning in verse 13, would somebody want to read down to probably about uh, verse 18, 13 to 18 for me? Thou hast been in Eden, I was giving it somebody else a chance, I used to read. <clears throat> Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, yep. and gold, the workmanship of the tabrets, <clears throat> and of thy pipes were prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covered, and I have set thee so thou that thou washed upon the holy mountain of God, thou hast walked and up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuary by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy tra traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. Amen. Now, does anybody get an idea who he's talking about here in this verse, these verses? It is. And one of the things that, uh, this is another little nugget, something we found many years ago. I love studying the Old Testament because it really brings to light so much that happens in the New. And I want you to look uh, in verse 13. Does any of those stones sound familiar from any other thing that you've studied in the Scripture? Where he talks about the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and uh, those stones. It's, the, it's like the breastplate that, that is on the high priest road. Uh, but there's a difference. There are three stones missing from this description that the high priest had, but the devil doesn't have. There are three stones missing. So I want you to look at it for just a minute. This is a little chunk of meat for you. I want you to be able to see. Let me give you a reference so you can kind of compare the two. Exodus chapter 28, verse 17 is where it starts. This is uh, making you all work a little bit this time. <laughs> Exodus 28, starting in 17. Huh? Uh, Exodus, Exodus 28, 17, 18, 19. Yeah, you're right. Verse 19, the whole third row is missing. All right, the third row says it's a ligure, an agate, and an amethyst. And they're missing from the description of the devil. Now, does anybody have an idea why it might be missing? Is that actually the name of those stones or it is? Yes. I've never heard of it. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the things that you'll find out, how many realize the devil is limited? He doesn't have all power. Only God has all power. Right? And uh, so, you know, the devil was a created being, so he, he's not greater than God. But every stone has a meaning, just like every name of the children of Israel has a meaning, right? And again, this may not make a lot of sense to you until you read the notes here that I put down. And, and I thought that it was a very good study to look at because when you look at it and you find out why these stones are missing, it reminds us that the devil doesn't have as much control as we think he does. That we're serving a mighty God. And that God is greater. That's why he said, greater is he who is within you than he that's in the world. Somebody said, all right, how do I find out what these stones represent? Well, when you go back in and you read from Exodus and then you also read in Genesis 49, you'll find that uh, these three stones represent Issachar, Gad, and Asher. And I want to give you the meanings behind this, as it says in Genesis 49. In Genesis 49 and 14, he said, Issachar is a strong donkey. He used the other name for donkey, uh, crouching down between two burdens. So Issachar represented a burden bearer, but it's missing from Ezekiel 28 because the devil can cause burdens, but he can't carry them. I said, the devil can cause trouble, but he can't help you through it. He'll get you out on the limb and then saw the limb off. Yeah, that's like the old saying, sin will take you further than you want to go and cost you more than you want to pay, and you end up staying along and you want to stay. <laughs> and then Gad, according to Genesis 49 and 19, says, a troop shall overcome him, but he shall overcome the last. So Gad represents an overcomer, but the devil cannot win. It's already been predetermined. I mean, I read the back of the book, we win if we'll hold on. Amen. Yeah. And that's why he said in Isaiah 14 that when he's cast down, they're going to narrowly look on him and say, is this the one that caused the nations to tremble? And yet sometimes we make the devil a lot bigger than what he really is. And a lot of times it ain't really the devil, it's the man in the mirror that's causing the trouble. That's right. And what did the Bible say? Death and life's in the power of the tongue. And uh, and then finally, I want to throw this out here before we get into Revelation. This is just something I wanted to share with you because I kind of get so tired of folks blowing the devil out. of. I know he's got power. I know he's a raging. I know he's walking about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But, you know, we ought to give no place to the devil, the Bible says. And so we ought to shut him down. I never will forget a young preacher called me one time, and he said the devil said, and I cut him off. And he started talking again, and I cut him off again. And he said, boy, you're rude, brother. I said, no. I said, it's just if the devil's talking to you, it ain't even worth repeating. Why do you want to listen to the devil? The devil's a liar and the father of it. And so whenever I found this years ago, and it really encouraged me to know that the devil cannot bear a burden, and the devil cannot overcome. And then the third one is Asher. And it talks about him yielding royal dainties. In other words, that he would become great. But the devil will not ever be any greater than what he is. But that's why the Bible said in Revelation 12 that he's going about, you know, because he knows he has a short time. He, he's angry. And he's already lost the battle. He just doesn't realize it yet. And that's why if we hold on to God and hold fast our profession of faith without wavering, Amen. We're going to come through this. Amen. And so I just wanted to throw those couple of little nuggets out before we got into Revelation 1 and encourage you, quit giving power to the enemy. Quit, uh, you know, I, I, I remember one time I was living alone and uh, I got afraid in my own house and the Lord kind of rebuked my heart and my spirit and said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm scared. And he said, why are you scared? I'm here. And when the light comes, darkness has to flee. But sometimes we let ourselves get in the wrong mindset. And uh, a lot of Christians I know act like that they're defeated. Yeah, a lot of bad things has happened. But you know what the Bible said? These things must needs come to pass. Amen. So we, sh we need to quit looking at the now. We need to look ahead and realize that it ain't always going to be this way. 
that there is a heaven that is coming. There is a, a great day that is coming. And that's why he said in John 14, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You believe in God, believe also in me, for in my Father's house there are many mansions. He said, if it were not so, I would have told you. Behold, I go away to prepare a place for you, and if I go away, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. But sometimes I, I hear folks kind of, you know, getting in that old down and out spirit, and that, you know, uh, like, you know, man, I'd love to go back to the good old days. Well, they were good days, but the Bible said, that the glory of the latter house shall be greater than that of the former. God's still able to pour out of his spirit. God's not lost any power. God's not diminished in any way or sense. Amen. It's just that we've lost our appetite for the greater things of God. And uh, so I just want to encourage us tonight to get into the scripture. Amen. The Bereans, they searched the scriptures, and they were called more notable because they searched the scriptures. But... Now it's like the enemy is trying to steal our time and our desire to get into the Word of God. And I go some places and folks almost have the attitude, well, I've been there and I've done that. But, amen, we need to read it again and see what God can speak into our heart. Amen? amen. Any comments on those two little things? I know it's a little odd. A lot of times people say, I don't know about that. I ain't never heard that before. Well, again, you, you check out the notes and you see for yourself. Don't take my word for it. And that's just like any preacher you know, there are a lot of folks that take what a preacher says, and, and he's human. He's subject to miss it. He's subject to not dot an I across a T. Amen. Uh, let God be the truth, and every man a liar. Amen. Tribulation worth its patience. It does. It, it, it does. But that doesn't mean that we got to give up our shout. No. You know, the children of Israel, they hung their harps on the, the willows down by the rivers of Babylon, and they wept. When they remembered Zion, and they a lot of church folks, you know, I know have done that. Say, well, it's a different time. Well, it may be different, but same God. And if the children of Israel, you know, there's a scripture back in Jeremiah, and, and we quote Jeremiah 29 and 11 a lot, and we say, you know, I know the thoughts that I think concerning you, saith the Lord. But you know what? The word of the Lord came to them, said, build houses, plant vineyards, marry, you know, uh, and, and he wanted them to be blessed even though they were in Babylon. He didn't want them to quit living. And even though that we're in a world that is constantly against the church, Amen. God has called us to arise and shine in spite of what the world is doing. What does the Bible say in the 23rd Psalm? He prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. Somebody said, well, the devil don't want me to do it. Well, quit listening to the devil. There's a little old lady down in Alabama where I used to go down there and preach a lot. She, You know, I told you about her before. She didn't have the background of church like a lot of folks did. And she'd say, take a foot off a brake, let it roll, preacher. <laughs> and, and I think we need to do that. And I think we need, you know, Paul told Timothy, stir up the gift of God that's in thee. We're waiting for somebody to come along and bring revival. Revival's here if we want it. We just got to seek God. He said, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin, heal their wicked land. Let's not give up and fold up and lay down and die. David even said, I shall not die but live and declare the wonderful works of the Lord. This ain't all of it. Amen. God has called us for such a time as this. God's not made a mistake. Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God, and the grace that he bestowed upon me was not in vain. So I wanted to throw those things out to just provoke and encourage you. Look in to the Scripture. And, and I've heard folks say, well, I don't read Leviticus, and I don't read Numbers, and I don't read the, you know, the genealogies. You'd be surprised what you're missing whenever you cut things out. It's like the, uh, last week y'all made that cobbler, and, man, whenever I looked at it, I said, hmm, that looks interesting. And then when I tried it, I thought, oh, Lord, that's good. <laughs> I even told Rita, I said, who made that? And uh, it is some good stuff. but And so we really, I, I mean, uh, folks nowadays, I know that, you know, they're scared of the COVID. And I know that. But I asked a lady, I said, we're going to die anyway. Why not go out with a bang? I mean, wh I mean, use wisdom. I'm not saying that we take foolish chances. But I am saying we can't fold up and die either. And we have to keep seeking the face of God. What you're saying is if we're going to go to Walmart and Free City, we can go to church. That's what I'm saying. Amen. That's what I'm saying. 
And so, I, again, I just want to encourage you. And yet there are some people, you know, uh, I know a dear sister right now, you know, she's she's got some things uh, going on in her lungs and, and and I mean, technically dying anyway, and said, I'm afraid to come to church. Well, I said, well, you know that, you know, they've told you, you, you know, you're going to die. I, I believe I'd be spending what time I could in the house of God instead of isolating. It's just like any... Uh, animal program you watch, what does a predator do? He tries to weed out the weak, the sick, and the lonely because they become easier to pray. But when we as the church begin to bind together and begin to pray one for another, there's power in unity. And every house or kingdom divided cannot stand. So I wanted to encourage you with that. I know it's two little short thoughts, but Anybody got any comments you want to make before we get into Revelation chapter 1? And eventually, like I said, we will be going into the gifts. It's a very very good short thought. And one thing that came to my mind, a lot of, or most all the verses that you so eloquently bring out of your mind, we, I've heard them, I've been going here almost 50 years, I've heard them all my life in this church. Don't really read them more and so you bring that back to mind with a good picture. Yeah, <laughs> and you know this one sister down in Florida I talked to her she said boy I wish I had the memory and I said well it's not so much about memory it's just every day for me every day and out of repetition and somebody said well I work well I understand that but you got to make time for the Lord and the devil he'll steal your time if he can I mean you know I, I've seen people say man I'm going to read my Bible more this week than I did last week and before they know it they read less than they did before because the devil threw everything at them and so you have to make up your mind. And, and I've been praying for your church. I want to see God stir you all up. I want to see folks get saved. I want to see things happen, not just here, but everywhere that we go. We help one church on Tuesday. We help a different one on Wednesday. We come here on Thursday and, uh, and, and go other places. And there are people who need help. And they're waiting for that singing group or that one preacher to come through. But I got news for you. It ain't in that. One person can't carry this. It has to be gone. And so when the church begins to pull together and pray one for another, you know what? God can send revival. God can send the move of God in your midst in the spite of what's going on around you. So that didn't cost you anything. Any other comments before we get into Revelation chapter 1? Now, I love the book of Revelation, and somebody said, well, you know, it's prophecy, and it's hard to understand, and I always tell folks, Revelation teaches us a lot of important things, and one of the things that it teaches us is that a lot of people are wrong, and somebody said, does that mean that you're pushing your idea above all others? No. What I am saying, that when you get three or four different ministers saying, God showed me, and they all got three or four different ideas, somebody's wrong. God didn't show three or four people three or four different ways. The Bible said there's no private interpretation. And so we just need to get in and begin to realize what it is. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and he signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now, why did he send it and what's this about? It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not about us. It's still about him. Acts 4 and 12 said, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And I, I've had folks sometimes say, Well, what do you mean that it must shortly come to pass? Hasn't it been about 2,000 years? Well, you've got to understand that God is outside of time. God is not like us. Uh, the Bible even said in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, but, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So even though that it's been about 2,000 years, it's only been a couple of days in the eyes of God. And so God's timetable is not like ours. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says, To everything there is a season, and a time for every purpose under heaven. And even in John 11, you remember Mary and Martha wanted Jesus to come and Touched Lazarus before he died, but he died, and they thought he was too late, but he was still on time. And there are people today that get discouraged and say, why is God letting all this stuff go on? Amen. God is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, because I still believe there are souls that need to be saved. 
It's not that God has turned a blind eye to anything. God sees, and God will handle it in his time. But until that time comes, we need to remember that God does have a timetable. So thank God. I'm just waiting on my ride. Job said it this way, all the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change comes. So we shouldn't be afraid of the end, but I've had people get plumb mad at me. I mean, you know, uh, evil mad. I mean, you know, fuss. And they say, stay off that end time stuff. It's scary. Well, honey, if it's scary, you maybe need to bump an altar and get things right between you and the Lord because God wants us to be prepared. I mean, that'd be like any of you if your children were two or three states away and been gone for a long time and they were coming home. I I pretty much believe you'd probably run to meet them in the airport, wouldn't you? And that's why God delights in the death of his saints. We're going to a place where there'll be no more devil. Hallelujah. I could care less about the street of gold or the walls of Jasper and all the beauty. I could care less about any of that. I want to be where there's no more devil. Feller said one time, he said, I get up every morning and say, hello, Lord. And he said, I know the devil's right there, too, trying to, you know, uh, uh, distract me. But uh, thank God we're going to a place he can't get in that garden. And so it ought to excite us. And we ought to think about this. And we ought to tell people, it's not that we're just trying to, you know, stay out of hell. And I don't want to go to hell either. But there is a whole lot more that God has planned for us than we can even imagine. The Bible even said, eyes not seen. Ears not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man all of the good things that God has prepared for them that love him. So I want to see, don't you? But he did go on to say, but he has revealed them unto us by his spirit. So we get a little preview of coming attractions. You know, you get that good service and the Holy Ghost moving. You think, whoo, I don't know if it gets any better than this. We can stand it or not. I want to try, don't you? I'm not satisfied with just saying, well, that's it. And he sinned and he signified it by his angel unto his servant John because God never does anything without confirming it. God lets everything be done and it's confirmed. He said, who by record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Now, verse 3, this is why we're here tonight. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Now, God's saying that if you want to be blessed, then you need to get into this book. Amen. And I've been through it so many times, and every time I go through it, I find new things and things that I never actually saw before. But I love how that in this third verse, he gives us some little uh, details that a lot of people miss because it's one thing to read it, and it's another thing to hear it. And it's like when I was in school. I don't know if anybody ever struggled in school. And, you know, did you read your homework? Yeah, but I didn't retain it. And it's one thing to go, you know, and go through it, but it's another thing to let it seep in and to actually get a hold of it. And you know what I found out? If you really like what you're doing, if you really are interested in what you're doing, you'll retain it a whole lot more than just feeling like that you've got to do three, four, four, five chapters a day. So he said not only reading it, but hearing it. And then the third thing, it's not just the hearer that's justified, but it's the doer. So it's not enough just to hear it, not enough just to read it, because you can say, yeah, the end's coming, and still go about your own routine. Doesn't, doesn't profit you anything. you got to keep those things. And... I'm pretty sure everybody's probably got something at your home that you want to keep, right? I mean, you've probably got something that is uh, a memorial or something that has a lot of memories to it. I've got a little box at home with some of my toys I had when I was a boy that I've held on to. And things that are precious, you put in a very precious spot. That's what I'm saying. You know, you don't just aimlessly throw them out there and say, well, it doesn't matter where I put them. You won't know where it is because it's important to you. And uh, my wife, you know, we almost been married 28 years, and uh, ever so often she she's good at the origami, and she can fold, and she'll say, here's, here's my heart again, and she'll give me a little paper heart. And I've got those. I've got those in a very special place because they're important to me. Well, if the Word of God is important to us, it needs to have preeminence. If we're going to keep those things, if we're going to let those things remind us, it's more than just wearing a T-shirt that says Jesus or a, a cross around your neck. 
needs to be part of your daily life. And I don't know about you, but I talked to him today. Did you, have you? Amen. I have. Any comments before we go on? Verse 4, John to the seven churches in Asia. Now, I love how that he begins to greet them by saying, Grace be unto you and peace. He didn't say, Be afraid. Be very afraid. For God has not given unto us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. And he said, Grace and peace be unto you from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Now, now we covered that when we talked about the Godhead. Does everybody understand what the seven spirits of God are? Seven's a perfect number. Seven's a perfect number, and it's really just the attributes that make God up who he really is. And you can find the actual reference in Isaiah 11. I like actually going through the New Testament. You can read about the spirit of holiness and, and the different attributes. It's like uh, this brother right here. If I said, who is he? You couldn't just say he's, what, 5'8", five, 5'9", five, whatever, you, how tall. you. If I said, oh, I want to know who he is. It's, is he easy going? Does he get mad easy? You know, there would be some things that make up who he really is. And so over here in Isaiah 11, uh, just for those that maybe don't know, uh, it talks about some things here that most commentators uh, go back and, and hit. Uh, verse 2 is where that it talks about the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, spirit of counsel and might, spirit of the knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And it's like I tell folks all the time, God is the God of love, but that ain't all there is to him. Amen. One day he has promised that he would judge the world in righteousness. And there is going to be an accounting day. The Bible said in Romans 6 and 23, the wages of sin is death. And so even though people think they're getting away with it right now, there will be an accounting day. And so, you know, he's telling them, you know, giving them that greeting, grace and peace be unto you. And then he's talking about the seven spirits of God. And God's a complete God. There's nothing lacking in him. I know in India, in the Hindu system, they have millions of gods. And it's so sad when you go there. Uh, people starving to death in their cows, just literally walking around just everywhere. And they even have rat temples where they go and they feed the rats. And, and the grain and the milk and the things that, I mean, they don't have to be as bound as they are. But ignorance will bind you. And somebody said, well, I'd never do that. Well, there are people around here that give their life away to the enemy, to drugs and alcohol, mm -hmm. and let the devil steal their peace and let the devil steal their future. And they have convinced themselves that they're worthless because of things that the devil has said. But the Bible plainly says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We're made in the image of God. So there are a lot of great things that you can glean from the book of Revelation. Not just, and, and it breaks my heart that people want to fight over, you know, the kitchen away of the church, you know, and uh, is it before, middle, or after? Well, tell them to be ready, and you'll have every base covered instead of falling out. I know folks right now that if you believe in kitchen away before the, the tribulation, they won't fellowship with you. And then I know others that if you're in the middle, they won't fellowship with you. And you know what? The devils are standing back laughing at us because we're fighting over this instead of telling people, be ready. I believe years ago they said, T.D. Jakes used to say, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. And somehow we've lost that message in the church. And we've gotten distracted by all these little things. Any comments before we go on? Uh, verse 5 said, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Man, what a wonderful God that we have that, that gave his life. He said, freely I lay my life down, freely I take it back up again. Uh, no, nobody actually took it from him. He laid it down. He gave it willingly. And, and that's why the Bible said that, you know, in due time Christ came and he died for us, the ungodly. Wasn't that we were perfect enough that we were reaching up? It was while we were yet sinners that he came. In John three sixteen, the very foundation of our faith, for God so loved the world that he gave 
his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So I love how that here in the very beginning he's identifying this is the revelation of Jesus Christ and that it's going to come quickly. It must shortly come to pass. He signified it by his angel John, by record of the word of God, and said it's a blessing if you'll meditate on it. Who's it to? To the seven churches. Grace and peace be unto you. And then he's identifying who Christ is, the one that has washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's why the Bible said you've been redeemed not with corruptible things, such as silver and gold. That would have been something to just, to, you know, had him maybe, you know, give silver and gold and say this is how much you're worth. But he said you're worth more than that, and he gave the very best that heaven had to offer. And that's why I love him. Don't you love him? Amen. Now, verse 6, verse 6, And has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory. Amen. I, I love this. And dominion forever and ever. And, and this is talking about us. He has made us kings. We have authority here on the earth. He said, Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and all the power of the enemy. And even though that we have been called and we have been anointed to go out, we're not to get so high and mighty that we forget that we are also a priest. In other words, we're servants. We ought to be able to get down and wash one another's feet, that we ought to be able to serve one another. But you know, I've met some individuals that kind of let the king part go to their head and they wanted to be called bishop or they wanted to be called reverend or they, you know, I said, hey, just call me brother, you know, just call me brother because, you know, his name's what's important. It's not about me. And I'm nobody without him. In other words, without him, I'm nothing. And uh, so sometimes I think, you know, these guys who want, you know, all the accolade, hey, I don't care how blessed and how knowledgeable you are. The Bible said, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. And if it wasn't for God, we wouldn't have anything. Hello. So I believe that we need to have that humility and I know when I went into Africa and they said, you're different. I kept jumping off the platform down in among the people and laying hands and praying. And they said, some of these guys, you know, would come in with their $1,000 suits and didn't want to touch nobody, didn't want to get dirty, didn't want to get sweaty, you know, didn't want to get nobody's, and I'm going to say the word snot on them. And, and, and you know, and therefore people would not listen. But thank God, whenever Jesus got a hold of me, he took the good, the bad, and the ugly and he cleaned me up, and he turned my life around. And I'm telling you, that's why I am so excited about Jesus. And I tell people everywhere I go, he's the best thing that could ever happen to you in this life. And with this verse here, I think it goes along with Galatians 6, that he says that if we see a brother or sister overtaken in a fault, we don't judge them, but we consider our own selves. And we're to go to, you know, Ye who are spiritual, you're to go to such a one in a spirit of meekness and realize that could have just as easily been you as it was them. And a lot of folks have forgotten where God's brought them from. David said he he found me in that horrible pit. And he picked me up out of it, set my feet on a solid rock and established my goings. And, uh, and we ought to have that same compassion one for another to have mercy upon them because when you don't have mercy on somebody else, then, amen, I, I think, you know, you've forgotten what God's done in your life. That's why, you know, I said, yeah, there are people out there that sin and they're an abomination and, and all that, but, you know, a lot of them won't come to the church because they think the church don't want them there. And I've told people, hey, you come to church. As long as you behave yourself, you know, it's where you need to be. Now, I understand if they're getting drunk and disorderly or doing things that they shouldn't, you sometimes have to say something. But I don't care who it is, we are begotten by the word. Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they, (laughs) hello, they preach except they be sent. So it's a wonderful, wonderful thing as we begin to get in and we begin to see what God is doing. And he said, behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him, even so, amen. Now, right here is where some folks get a little mixed up, and, and it's a difference of opinion. As far as that, they, they think that when he comes literally, then 
everybody's going to see him at the exact same time. I believe that people who die without the Lord, I believe they know that they've died without the Lord right then, you know. And I know a lot of folks have a lot of different opinion. I've been at the bedside of those that were ready, and I've been at the bedside of those that were not. And I've, I've heard them say things that, that left a very unique testimony behind, I'll put it that way. So whether, whether they're right or whether they're not, I think it's not something that we should get so wrapped up. But we do know, according to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that we all are going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. One day we're going to have to give an account the deeds done in our body, whether they be good or whether they be evil. And uh, are you getting anything out of this one tonight? Amen. All right. And uh, he said, uh, I am Alpha and Omega. Everybody understand what that is? That's the beginning of the Greek alphabet and the end. Um, little nugget right there that uh, a friend of mine told me. He said, well, if you put that in Hebrew, it would be I'm the Aleph, which is the beginning of the alphabet, and the Tov. But he said, uh, when you look at it in Hebrew, uh, he said Hebrew letters also are demonstrated by pictures. In other words, they have a picture that can be the same as that letter. And I said, all right, what does that mean? He said, well, the Aleph, the, the first character of their Hebrew alphabet, is symbolized by the, like the head of a cow, just a very rough drawn the head of a cow. And he said the Tav, the N, is symbolized by a cross. And he said, you ready for something unique? I said, all right. And he said, what, what does that mean? He said, well, the covenant started with the offering of the bulls and the goats, but it ended at the cross. Amen. So interesting to stop and think. Somebody said, what if he's wrong? Well, what if he's right? Because we do know that that is the truth, that it did start with bulls. And thank God we don't offer up bulls and goats anymore. But it, it was all took care of at the cross. Said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come. And the reason why he says it like that is because he was born and he died and he rose again. So he, which is which was and which is to come. And even though he rose again, he's not in our past. He's also in our future. He is coming again. All right, verse 9. I really like verse 9. I preached on verse 9 a lot over the years. And, and I like it how that sometimes that we, uh, we, we talk about these, these gentlemen. And he said, I, John, who am your brother and companion in tribulation... And the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. He said, I'm just like you were. I'm your brother. I'm your companion in, in tribulation. And they put him on the isle of Patmos thinking they were hurting him, but they were really helping him. They were just giving him a place to be alone with God. And sometimes the enemy will make us feel like that we're losers. You ever felt that way? You ever felt isolated? Felt like, where's everybody at when I need them? Well, I'm glad that we've got a God who said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He's not just the God of the mountains. He's also the God of the valley. And so John is getting ready to find that out, even though he's there for uh, the testimony, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. He said, and I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Oh, he didn't have no fancy singing, but he was in the spirit. He didn't have a good amen corner, but he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And uh, I think that that ought to encourage us that no matter where we're at, kind of like Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. God can still let us get into the spirit even when the singers didn't show up and when the amen corner is silent. Amen. And uh, one old preacher friend of mine used to say, I can't get no help in here. And he would try to pump, and then he said, you know, I got to the point, it didn't matter if they helped me or not, my help comes from above. <laughs> Any comments on the first ten verses? All right, uh, verse 10, the last part of it, he said, And I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book, 
and sent it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. So he's sending this message out. And I believe that when we get a message from God, God wants us to send it out. God wants us to share the word of God. God wants us to encourage one another because we'll find out later in uh, Revelation, especially in chapter 12, how did they overcome? They overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Sometimes the enemy can make you feel like that you're the only one going through what you're going through with. That, that's what happened to Elijah. Lord, I'm the only one that's left. They've dug down your altars. They've killed your prophets. And Lord, I'm the only one. You ever feel that way? You ever feel like, man, nobody understands, nobody knows the trouble you've seen? Well, I'm glad that, amen, we can read the word of God and find out that we're not the only one, that the same afflictions are accomplished in our brethren that are in the world. Amen. He said, and I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and I turned and I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the patch with a golden girdle. Now a couple of things I want us to notice right here that these golden candlesticks represent the churches. And when he looks, he sees one likened unto the Son of Man, in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Isn't it good to know that God's still in his church? Amen. Somebody said, but man, we're having it tough. Well, God's still here. God hasn't left. God's still good God. God's good Amen. All, the all the time. Amen. I thank you for that. <laughs> That's what I was looking for. God's good all the time. <laughs> and so he's there. And, and sometimes, you know, we need to encourage one another with that, that God hasn't went anywhere. God's still in the midst of his people. I mean, what did the Bible say in Isaiah 7 and 14? And the Lord himself shall give you a sign. A virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and ye shall call his name Emmanuel. God with us. Not God far away from us. Some people would have you to believe you got to go to, uh, you know, another state or another country to find God. But I'm glad that you just got to hit your knees. You just got to cry out to him. Jeremiah 33 and 3, Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. Get me a water here. Anybody got anything to say? Well, I'm taking just a second. I've always uh, pushed Revelation aside because of one of the things you said. If I'm ready, it doesn't matter. I'm covered beginning, middle, and end. So just be ready, and it don't matter. Well, I think that's true to a certain extent uh, yeah, on that point, but sometimes we need to be reminded of the encouragements that are there. And so if you push it to the side, then sometimes it's like missing dessert. <laughs> and we need to know what to tell, testify to others. We really do. What is the um, and... And again, you know, there are people right now, and I get messages every day uh, through the Internet. Well, are we going to have a nuclear war? What if, what if, what if, what if, what if? And you know what I do? I point them back to the Scripture that if we're in Christ, we don't have to be afraid. Right. Because that if we die, we're the Lord's. Whether we live or we die, we're the Lord's. And I share with him how that the church thrived during persecution. And uh, there are certain parts of, you know, the book of Revelation that we share with them, and I tell them, get your encouragement from this and not just from what you're seeing and what you're hearing. So I'm not really afraid of that uh, per se. I worry more about my lost loved ones. I worry more about those who are not ready. I know that my ticket's paid for. And, you know, my pastor always used Satan. I know that I know that I know that I know that I know. And just, he get wrapped up in that. But sometimes I think that we do this, um, do a disservice to ourselves. It's not just revelation. There are other parts of the scripture that sometimes I see people push aside. And I've known men of God that have preached for years and still haven't read the entire Bible all the way through. Simply because there were certain parts that were more difficult that were harder maybe for them to understand. But again, 
Mama used to make me eat things when I was little. She said, good for you. But why? I said so. That's why. And, and sometimes it's like that in the spirit that you don't find out till later that really how important it was. And so I just want to encourage you, even though it seems like a, you know, a big book or a book that's hard to understand, man, there are some things through there that will bless your heart. And, and I don't know about you, but I need all the blessing I can get in this day and age that we're living in. From the start you got, then if you keep on in Revelation, it sounds like I'm on <laughs> well, I, I hope so. I hope so. That's our goal. I'm, I mean, I didn't come, you know, to waste nobody's time. I didn't come to just, you know. And it's like I told you the first day, I said, I'm not Solomon. I don't think I'm wiser than anybody else. I see a lot of these jokers get them. God showed me. Maybe he did, but yeah. I don't think so if you got three or four different ideas. It is. You know, a lot of times people think they validate it by saying God said, you can think. I feel like God showed me, or I feel like this is the way it is. And I mean, I'll be the first to tell you, I, I don't have the corner of the market on this. But I, when I teach Revelation, I've been doing it for another church uh, once a week for several months now. And uh, I, I do it looking at the practical application, meaning there are some things in there that we need to get a hold of for our church today. And uh, and like I said earlier, um, I think, you know, um, a lot of churches are missing it because we're kind of backing off and we're kind of being at ease and we're waiting on somebody to come through with the answers. We already got the answers right here in the Word of God. And God said he was not the author of confusion. That's it. Yeah. That's it. And so, you know, pray, seek God, you know, live, go forward. Jesus said, he didn't stop in John 10 and verse 10 when he said, the thief coming not before to steal, to kill, and destroy. He said, but I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. And so uh, that's what I tell people is that there is some things written in the Bible. So, And, and he sees him clothed uh, with the garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle, and his head... And his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And uh, I believe that this description, we're seeing him more in his high priestly role and how that he intercedes for you and I today. And I'm glad that God does intercede for us. And uh, sometimes we're kind of like Peter. We have a Peter mentality. Lord, I'll die for you. God, I'll never deny you. Lord, I won't do anything wrong. I won't let you down. And Luke chapter 22, what did he tell him? He said, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith faileth not. And he said, when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. And so sometimes, I'll, have you ever had your feet knocked out from underneath you spiritually? Amen. I have. I say, you know, you, you think, man, I got this figured out. And then you realize you don't know nothing the way that you ought to know. Amen. That it's all about him. And so that's why I try to encourage us to, you know, hang on to the Word of God. And uh, I like how that his eyes were as a flame of fire. You'll never fool God. You'll never pull the wool over on him. God sees everything. His eyes are over the righteous. His ears are open unto our, our prayers, our cries. His feet like an undefined brass is burned in the furnace. And uh, he's walked through the fire for you and I. Amen. Tasted judgment for every one of us. Amen. Uh, he, uh, uh, it's like when we're talking about the Godhead, when Abraham was trying to cut the covenant in Genesis 15, uh, God manifested himself as a smoking furnace and a burning lamp, and he walked between those pieces or passed between those pieces. Because when you cut covenant, you would divide the animal and you would walk through the blood. It was kind of a shadow of what was to come. And, and God did that himself in Genesis 15. So um, I'm, I'm glad that we have a God that is just so complete. Amen. And uh, says his voice was as the sound of many waters because never a man spake like this man. And I'm kind of uh, rushing to get through uh, at least this chapter before we close. Uh, God's voice, there's so many wonderful scriptures about the voice of God and how that his word is powerful. The Bible said where the word of a king is, there's power. And remember through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they said, never a man spake like this man. 
There was just something about the voice of God. And so his voice was as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Now there's a lot of references we could share with you right there about how the right hand was typical of the hand of blessing. They would lay the right hand, the sheep on the right, goats on the left. So many scriptures we could share there, but I'm glad that God has it all in the palm of his hand. And I believe that that uh, out of his mouth went that sharp two-edged sword. I believe that's referring to the word of God. And uh, notice this, verse 17. Now, when John sees this, he had a, an experience like a lot of folks have today, and they say, is it biblical? He fell out because he said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And sometimes we get overwhelmed by the power of God because these, these old fleshly bodies, they can't handle it. I like the term overwhelmed by the Spirit more than slain. Slain mean, sounds like you're being killed. <laughs> and the Spirit comes to give life, not to, not to take life. And so overwhelmed. And when he, he said, I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not. Again, God's not given unto us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. He said, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Hallelujah. He's alive. We're not serving a dead God. And he said, I have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. And then he explains in verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. Uh, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So that's Revelation chapter 1, kind of the way that I do it, just in the application process. And.